So today I'm going to tell you a little story about my evolution from academia into enterprise. And the story starts like any other story. A typical day in the lab and an inspirational walk on the beach. Maybe not quite like every story. But needless to say, I was a graduate student at the Joint School of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering working with fullerenes, preparing for my dissertation. When I received a phone call, from an old friend and an industry collaborator. And they said to me on the phone, Anthony, we need to figure out something with forage fish and this fishing problem. I had no clue what he was talking about that day. But we spent a lot of time on the phone discussing forage fish. I'll tell you a little bit about this fish. The forage fish are small schooling fish. They're oily. We typically catch them by the loads using large nets. They're extremely important to all of our oceans as they form the backbone of all of the ocean's nutrition. They transfer the energy from plankton up the food chain. So all of the fish in the ocean rely on these. All of our seabirds that fly over into the ocean rely on these fish and our coastal mammals and other animals all rely on these fish. The challenge that was presented to me on the phone that day was their utilization, which was unsustainable. Historically, we considered these fish unlimited. But what happened over time was multiple industries started sticking their hands in the forage fish cookie jar. We use these fish to feed our farmed fish, aquaculture, as they make these fish healthy for us to eat. We also eat these fish, and we take these fish as vitamin supplements from their fish oils that's extracted from them. They're also ground up and fed into our barnyard animals as agriculture feed. And even our companion kitties eat them. It's in our cat food. But I'm going to start my journey, my talk with you today, about their utilization as bait. So every year, about 40% of the total fish that we capture in our oceans are these small schooling fish. Again, they're net caught very easily to catch large amounts of them. About 18 million tons of these fish get used to bait a trap. So we're using a fish to catch a fish. And that's what that conversation was about. How can we create something more sustainable? Because the utilization by all of these industries was just too much now. It was starting to affect the oceans. It was also starting to affect the coastal vibrancies of fishing communities. They needed solutions. And the methods that are used to capture these fish are not great. These large nets that run across the bottom of the ocean, scraping and destroying the floor and coral, they also indiscriminately catch other animals and trap them within the net. So, as a scientist, we devised the strategy and we went into the lab. And the R&D process went from there. What we had to do was figure out why crustaceans were attracted to a trap that was being baited with these forage fish. Seemed simple enough. We had all the tools at our hands. What we needed to do was figure out exactly why the crustacean traveled to that trap with the forage fish. And we had to identify individual molecules that were being released from the fish as it sat in the trap. And we used things like high-performance liquid chromatography and mask spectroscopy to be able to identify the individual molecules that were being emitted from these fish traveling around the trap and luring crustaceans in. We found a lot of molecules, and we were able to articulate which combination of molecules had the most profound impact on luring these species to a trap. And we really thought we were close to being done. But then we had to figure out how to make a matrix, a matrix that would adapt to all fishing communities, because fishing is very different in different places. It might be shorter a couple of days in some places. It might be two weeks in other places. And the temperatures change. 
So we had to accommodate the industry in order to be able to have a successful deployment of an alternative bait that could introduce sustainability and vibrancy back into this sector. So we designed several different matrices with the fortunate help from organizations like the National Science Foundation and the North Carolina Sea Grant. The infrastructure that we had available to us at the Joint School of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering, we were able to come up with an alternative, a synthetic and sustainable method of fishing without ever having to use fish. And it was something the industry needed. So when we met with the industry, there were several things that we had to incorporate into this idea. Not just something that worked, but we had to solve some pains along the way. And the research had to be dedicated to creating a bait that didn't require refrigeration or storage, and it was stable, and it was very easy to use. And it could attract crabs and lobsters, and could be consistently available and competitive with what they were already using. They were thrilled, and so were we. And then I got another phone call. And on this day, the person on the other end said, does your bait work for eels and whelks? Along the Northeast here, eels and whelks are commonly caught. I honestly didn't know the answer to that question. But I had two undergraduate students at the time, and I told them, look into this. And the next morning, they came in and said, Anthony, it's bigger than bait. It's horseshoe crabs. Horseshoe crabs. Well, horseshoe crabs were what this industry was using as bait. But what we learned was the value of the horseshoe crab to society was tremendous. So what if I were to tell you that the blood from a horseshoe crab has affected everyone listening to this? And it's considered one of the most precious liquids on Earth. And it's about $60,000 a gallon. Would you believe me? What if I told you their blood was blue? Well, let me tell you a little bit about this unique blood from this ancient arthropod. The horseshoe crab has survived all of Earth's mass extinctions. It is a very resilient organism. And within its blue blood is a single circulating cell type. It's called the amoebocyte. And within that amoebocyte are proteins. And those proteins interact with the gram-negative bacteria. Whenever a gram-negative bacteria is in the presence of these amoebocytes, a gel clot forms. And why this was important to us was because this method became the approved method and the ideal method to ensure that anything that was injected into us, an antibiotic, perhaps more timely in these days, a vaccine, of which we have 120 in development globally right now, an instrument that might be implanted in us. All of these things are safeguarded, quality controlled, through this ancient horseshoe crab's blood cell, the amoebocyte. But, as I mentioned, there's a problem. Our coastlines are changing, they're eroding, which is the areas where the horseshoe crabs spawn. Secondary to that, our oceans are changing. I already mentioned that they were used as bait, but another challenge is their utilization in serving us as a quality control measurement. Right now, we go out to the beaches and collect crabs and bring them back to a facility, and they're bled for about a third of their blood volume, and then in time, they're redeployed. And this process can take a day or two or three, and it can be challenging for these animals. So we thought, hmm, what if we could aquaculture them? Sounds like a good opportunity for both modern medicine and a vital species. So that's exactly what we did. We went back to all of our friends at the National Science Foundation that helped us do the organobait research. We went back to the North Carolina Sea Grant. We reached out to everyone we knew, and we decided to prove that we could do horseshoe crab aquaculture. 
which would be an ability to grow these crabs and maintain these crabs in a pristine environment, proximal to where you would take their blood. And you could ensure that their environment was managed and safe and optimized. And what we would do is we would provide them the best feed that you could to make sure that they're healthy. And our goal was to be able to eliminate the need for wild capture, preserving this species and maintaining this great donation that this species makes to modern medicine. It took some time, but we got there. Here in North Carolina, we have horseshoe crabs. They eat some of the best functional feed you can imagine. And we believe that they can continue making this contribution based on this research. But we really weren't done there because we had a new opportunity. You see, the amoebocyte and the LAL always had an opportunity in human medicine but it had never been found compatible in a blood specimen due to inhibitors or interference. So we set out to prove that, because we now had proved we could aquaculture horseshoe crabs, and we could make an unlimited supply of LAL sustainably. Could we use this to optimize the way that we detect for bacteria in patients in the hospital? You see, because this is a big problem. There's not many great instruments out there that do it. And a lot of times, by the time you know it, it can be too late. The bacteria has overburdened the system and the patient has drifted into sepsis, which is the number one cause of untimely death in the hospital. So we thought we could remove this problem associated with current methods, which is unreliable and takes a couple of days, and days are not what people have. Given that we had now an unlimited supply of LAL, we had a real opportunity to make a meaningful impact. And just as we were getting there, we were so close. We discovered exactly what we needed and we were ready to move forward. And all of a sudden, our world changed. We got confronted with a viral pandemic. And the way that the world, the very fabric of the world was disrupted, the way we did everything. But we weren't ready to stop anything we were doing. What we wanted to do was leverage what we knew and figure out how we could apply that right now towards this situation, knowing that we were going to go back to these other things, but we had a moral obligation to these new risks that were being imposed in society. So we had learned a lot along the way about the horseshoe crab, but more importantly, the horseshoe crab had taught us a lot about pathogens. In order to conduct the research, we needed to understand how pathogens behave when dealing with a new virus. We also had a very strong foundation in nanoscience. So we thought, given what the horseshoe crab had taught us and our understanding of nanoscience, what if we could create an atomic scale antimicrobial that was urgently needed and could solve a lot of the problems associated with the current pandemic. We arrived at fullerenes, which is a nanoscale molecule of about one nanometer in size, 120 times smaller than a virus, that can be specially functionalized to impart a massive antimicrobial effect. And we considered how we could apply this to the current situation. And we looked at the shortcomings associated with the current situation. Masks that we wear today are great, but they predominantly function as barrier garments, preventing something from getting through. It's a size filtration. We thought, OK, we might have an improvement here, using what the horseshoe crab taught us, using what we knew about fullerenes, using what we knew about atomic scale interactions, we also looked at the other areas that could be improved. The garments we wear, the booties on our feet, the lab coats, the physician's coats, the sheets, the upholstery, the fabric in hospitals, all of these areas where these pathogens were being found, what if we had a way to make them bioactive? 
give them an ability to draw pathogens in, but not just hold them, impart an effect that destroyed them, and we could eliminate it, significantly reducing transmissibility of the pathogen. And that's what we're focusing on now because we have an obligation and a vision. We believe that frontline workers need better safety and they shouldn't be scared when they go into work. And we think that we have the research that could help improve this situation. Or those in nursing homes can see their families again because we could create mechanisms to safeguard them. No one should feel unsafe at work, but if we could improve the way that we protect our employees, the world could get back to operating, potentially returning to some sense of normalcy. We might go out to dinner again, doing things a different way, using the research that was available and thinking a little differently, maybe drawing some experience from a nanomaterial or listening to a million-year-old blue-blooded arthropod. We'll get back to traveling, seeing the places, helping those areas that rely on tourism, and bringing the world back together. The goal here in this talk is to inspire everyone. You're going to be met with a lot of challenges. I am embrace the risk, and I hope that you will too. Take on the risk. Embrace every new opportunity, whether it was going from forage fish to horseshoe crabs, all the way down to antimicrobial substances that could help in a pandemic. Stay motivated and embrace every risk and every opportunity scholastically and thoughtfully. Thank you.